Welcome back everyone for yet another video on the third to fourth best systems design channel on the internet. As you can see, uh, my skin has mean reverted to its natural oily state and I look gross once again. Uh, it was only a matter of time, so what can you do? Today we're going to be talking about Kafka consumer groups. Now perfectly, when I do a lot of consumption, I prefer to do it, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, keep it individual. Uh, but some people are into that group stuff, you know, they like it freaky. So uh, I guess that's how the creators of Kafka are, so let's go ahead and talk about it. All right, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about consumer groups in Kafka. So I think this is probably going to be the last video about Kafka that I'm going to be making for now. I've been uh, glazing this technology pretty hard, but I feel like this is kind of the last core feature that deserves its own video uh, because it is something that you know is very, very useful when building out distributed applications, and we will talk about why. So basically, let's imagine that we have many different topic partitions, right? They all contain messages that we're interested in subscribing to, and we also have many different consumers, right? So the pool of consumers themselves might actually be dynamic, right? There may be consumers being added to that pool, consumers may be failing in that pool, such as the nature of dealing with distributed systems. So we want to be able to read all of the messages in a way that's scalable, fault tolerant, easy to use, and also fair, right? Like if I have a bunch of consumers and they can all process similar amounts of messages, it wouldn't be good if one consumer is processing significantly more than all the others. That would be bad. We'd be wasting a lot of our resources. So consumer groups are basically a feature in Kafka that's going to allow us to do all of this without having to write our own distributed coordination code, because otherwise that would get really complicated, it would make building out these applications a lot harder, and it would waste a lot of developer time and you know make us prone to a bunch of bugs. So consumer groups is just going to figure pretty much all of that out for us and you know give us a little bit of configuration in order to get the exact properties that we want. So basically, if we have a bunch of topic partitions, it can be multiple topics as well and multiple partitions within those topics, uh, we can divide them hopefully around equally into the consumers in the same consumer group. So basically all you have to do is in your consumer configuration, you specify a group.id. And if you know you were just one consumer that didn't want to be in a group, you would just specify your own unique group.id. Now the group.id is going to identify all the consumers in this group. And basically the unit of work that we can consume at one point is just going to be one single topic partition. So as the group size is actually going to you know either grow or shrink, uh, the work per consumer is going to get automatically rebalanced. That's kind of the main draw here, right? Because if we knew it was going to be a static pool of consumers, it wouldn't be that hard to basically statically map them to a bunch of Kafka partitions and try and balance that load. But given that we don't know exactly how many consumers we're going to have at a time, or you know the pool can change because one can go down or we want to add a new one, we want to basically be rebalancing that load accordingly. So basically, if I have topic one here and topic two here, and each of them have two partitions, let's say we have four consumers in our group to start, you know, one way of potentially balancing the load here, and probably the most fair and equal to it, would be to have every single consumer uh, consuming one topic partition from each of those two topics. Now let's imagine that this guy were to go down. Another thing the consumer groups is going to do for us is it's going to basically keep track of the committed offsets of the consumers across all of the subscribed topic partitions so that let's say this consumer over here takes this partition from it, we're going to resume from the last committed offset. Now of course that doesn't make everything perfect, right? Like unless we're using something like Kafka transactions, this could lead to double message processing or, or even at most message uh, at most once message processing depending on our configuration. Uh, but the point is you just have to configure that as well. It's not like automatically exactly once processing by virtue of using a consumer group. Cool, so let's go ahead and talk about the high level architecture here. So imagine this is my consumer group over here, <laughs> 69. Um, and basically, you know, we've got two nodes in it, and then a third one is going to be a new joiner. So in Kafka, uh, basically there's this internal topic called the consumer offsets topic. And we've spoken about this in the last few videos, but basically this is responsible for keeping track of the last known cons uh, offset consumed by a variety of consumers on every single input topic. And so basically this consumer offsets internal topic is itself partitioned across all the brokers in the cluster. And because it is just a normal Kafka topic, effectively, even though it's you know, used internally, what it means is that there is a leader for that consumer offsets topic. So let's say that this particular broker is the leader for the partition of the consumer offsets topic that this new joiner is interested in because you know it's consuming from basically some topic on a broker that you know corresponds to that part of the offsets queue. So basically in this case what I would do is say you know let's say the group ID is 69 I take the hash of it. Uh, what this is going to tell us is okay based on the hash of my group ID I know which uh, broker is going to basically be hosting uh, or considered the group coordinator 
for my consumer group because the hash of uh, the group ID corresponds to this particular consumer offsets queue. And then as a result, you know, all of the offsets for this particular consumer group are going into this particular topic right here and specifically that topic partition of it. So this is going to be the group leader. Uh, you can see also that, you know, if this is the partition one of consumer offsets, then it's going to have replicas on this broker over here. So this would be the replica partition one on this broker node. So if for whatever reason this guy were to go down, it could no longer be the group leader. This guy would uh, fail over and be the new group leader. But anyway, when the new joiner comes along, it's gonna say, hey, I wanna join the group. So the first thing that it's gonna do is go uh, to just any node in the cluster and then say, who is my leader? Right, the, the random node in the cluster is going to use that hashing logic to basically say, oh, it's actually gonna be this guy over here. So go ahead and reach out to him. So then he's gonna do that and say, I wanna join the group. Okay, so at that point, when we try to join a consumer group, we've got a bunch of different steps that we actually need to take right here. And it basically starts like this. So number one is we have that new member. We're gonna resume from where we were before. It's gonna join and it's gonna go to that broker group leader for the particular group, which again is based on the hash of the group ID. Once it does that, basically that broker leader is now going to reply to every other single member of the group that there is going to be some sort of rebalance in process. So that number, that step two is gonna go here, back to the new member. It's gonna go here, up to this member over here. And once they do that, basically uh, all of those group uh, members are gonna have to rejoin the cluster. So they're gonna have to send basically a, a join call back to the broker leader. So once they do that, now this is where things get interesting. So basically, out of these group members, you can see that I've written one is called the client leader, one is just a random other member, and then we've got our new member, but effectively that's just going to be an other member as well. So what the client leader is responsible for is the broker leader is going to send it in step three, all of the members of the group and all of the subscriptions. And the client leader is responsible for actually calculating which partitions or which topic partitions are going to be assigned to which uh, consumer. So it can use things uh, like a variety of different policies and also things like rack awareness in order to make these decisions. Now you might think, why are we doing this on the client? Well, actually the main advantage is that because we're doing this on the client, we can actually just run any arbitrary code in order to determine the topic partitions per consumer, which is really good if you have some sort of really complicated setup. That being said, there are some downsides to using a client and newer versions of Kafka actually try to mitigate these. So one downside, for example, would basically be if the client group leader is particularly slow, uh, then just doing this reassignment is going to take a really long time. And also now we just have to elect a single client group leader, which means if this guy goes down, there needs to be some sort of leader election to choose another one uh, on failover. So anyways, once the client determines uh, these values right here, what it's gonna do in step five is respond with the assignments back to the broker leader. And then the broker leader is going to basically cache those so that it can send them to all consumers the next time that they all reach out to the broker leader. And instead of calling join next time, they'll call this operation sync. So that makes it easy enough to get done. But, so it's worth noting, like I said, there are some serious downsides to using the client leader right here. What we might be better off doing instead is actually having the broker leader itself be uh, you know, computing the partition assignment. And so it can do that in newer versions of Kafka. Obviously it's going to be a little bit less flexible because you can't just run arbitrary code, uh, but this is kind of the direction that Kafka is starting to move towards, so worth, uh, worth noting. Okay, we're gonna talk about a few different types of basically partition assignment strategies. Like I mentioned, these are basically all implementing an interface, uh, but they come you know, pre-packaged into Kafka, and then of course you have the ability to write your own if you are doing so uh, and doing the partition assignment on a client. So like I said, your own, implement the interface. You can do something called range partitioning. You can do round robin partitioning. You can do sticky partitioning. Uh, you can call me a bit of a sticky assigner myself. I've done that once or twice. And then also cooperative sticky assignment. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, talk about all of these and the differences between them because they actually have pretty significant implications for how your data gets consumed down the line. Um, there's also this concept of rack awareness, right? Like if I have one particular Kafka broker, I'm gonna try and have it consumed by a Kafka consumer that's on the same rack as it because you're limiting the amount of network bandwidth that actually gets used uh, and you know reads within the same rack are gonna be faster and more efficient. Okay, so let's talk about range partitioning. Basically the idea here is that, you know, if I have two topics, each one with two partitions, 
It doesn't really matter how many consumers I have. I'm going to basically split the partitions in each topic so that they are aligned with every single consumer. So that the same number partition in each topic is gonna to go to the same consumer. So regardless of what topic it is, all of the one partitions are gonna to go to consumer one, all of the two partitions are gonna to go to consumer two, and then even if we have another consumer here that in theory could do some of the work, it doesn't matter, we're not gonna use it, and so in theory this is not going to be the most efficient in terms of actually balancing the load across our consumers. What range partitioning is really good for is doing co-located joins, right? Because a lot of the time, if these two topics in particular are partitioned on the same key and we're also joining on that key, right? So you, you know, in Kafka, you use the hash of a given message key in order to determine which partition it goes to. So if these two topics have the same number of partitions and also are joining on their message key, basically what it means is that any two messages that could potentially be joined to one another will be in the same partition. So then doing co-located joins is going to save us a ton of network, uh, networking bandwidth as well as uh, memory footprint because we're not going to have to cache as many messages uh, when determining whether two particular topics can be joined with one another. Like I mentioned, not necessarily the most even distribution of load just because of the fact that this guy can exist right here uh, and just get nothing. Okay, next we're gonna talk about round robin partitioning. This idea is pretty simple. Uh, you're gonna get really good load balancing because at the end of the day, we're basically just going down these partitions and assigning them in round robin to each consumer. The problem with that is your typical problem with something like round robining or hashing in general, which is that when the size of the consumer group changes, note that the assignments over here change pretty significantly, right? So this guy went from consuming one, three, five to now only consuming one and four. And it's like, well, it would have been better if he stayed just consuming one and three, and maybe this guy over here stayed consuming, uh, you know, two and four or something. The point is we're having too much uh, turnover in terms of the partitions uh, that people are subscribed to between shuffles. And so that basically, you know, arises the need for something like consistent hashing, which is basically the idea behind sticky partitioning. So sticky partitioning is using some sort of similar algorithm, like I said, to consistent hashing, I don't know the exact thing, to basically try and maximize the number of partitions that don't move when the consumer group changes, right? We're trying to make them as sticky as possible from one iteration of the consumer group to the next. However, I will say one thing that's particularly inefficient about sticky partitioning in general is that every single group member is going to revoke all of its partitions and then we're going to use basically the prior uh, you know, assignment to compute the next assignment. But during that time of computing them, every single partition is going to be revoked. Uh, we're not going to do any processing of those messages and then we're not going to get as good throughput as we would have liked. So in newer versions of Kafka, they implemented cooperative sticky partitioning, where basically instead of you know revoking all your partitions and then computing the new ones and then getting back what you had before, instead, they'll basically do two rounds of communication between all the nodes in the consumer group and the broker leader or the client leader. And the idea there is that in the first round, they're gonna figure out which partitions to revoke. Then in the second round, at the start of it, they revoke them. So those uh, partitions that are moving around get paused and then they just move to the new brokers that they belong on, right? So it's more of an incremental change, thus meaning that we can get higher throughput throughout the process. All right, bozo I am forgot to actually make a conclusion side, so I had to handwrite it, sorry for the handwriting. Basically the idea is like many other of these distributed systems tools like you know MapReduce or Spark or anything like that, the idea is we don't wanna write our own code here if we can avoid it, because doing stuff like this is really hard. So it's a lot easier than a bunch of developers uh, basically collaborate and make it so that they can build us tools that we can use instead. So consumer groups are going to be a really good example of that. Basically it's going to allow us to scale out our Kafka consumers without having to write a bunch of distributed code. We don't have to get Zookeeper involved or anything like that, because otherwise we probably would and it would be rough. Now. It's worth noting that you know consumer groups aren't just like, a, I'm gonna use a consumer group and now everything works, la di da di da You have to properly configure them. Uh, you need to know the differences between those partition assigners, the pros and cons of them, when you may wanna use a consumer-based uh, partition assigner, or you know one that runs on the client side versus one that runs on the broker side. And these are all important decisions to you know be aware of the fact that they exist. Well guys, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna run off because I'm in a little bit of a rush, uh, but see you in the next one and have a nice weekend.